are stars you know. <laughs> So we are live now. <laughs> okay, so let's start. So, hello, uh, ahojte, hello to everybody. Is it possible to hear me well? If yes, please leave the comment uh, on the bottom of this uh, live stream. I hope so, yes. <laughs> Uh, and now I will switch to Slovak language. Uh, dnešné podujatie Univerzitného technologického inkubátora STU bude historicky prvé, ktoré uskutočňujeme v anglickom jazyku. Takže prejdem rovno do angličtiny. So welcome everybody to the first live stream of University Technology Incubator of STU for a very first time in English language. The main topic is the biggest mistake in business and how to face them. I'm Andrea Miklasova and together with me is here my colleague uh, Livia Sokolova Hi. and our speaker Brian Jakubec. University Technology Incubator STU helps students, alumni and their teams to develop their project or startup to the next level. Actually, we have opened the first program start for validate the business idea, but if you have any uh, if you have uh, the ambition uh, to work in a startup or you already have a startup, but you need the new member for your team, please don't hesitate to fill the form on our webpage uh, incub.sk and on the main menu you will find the section networking. If you have any questions during the speech, uh, ask them through the Slido and the hashtag uh, that you have to use is Jakubec with the small letters or leave the comment on the bottom of this live stream. So now I would like to specially welcome our speaker, Brian Jakubec, and introduce him. Brian is a native English speaker mentor, coach, consultant, and strategic planner. He is the son of a successful Bata entrepreneur and uh, heard of the historical legacy of the Bata School of Work. Brian has many years of experience in the information technology industry. Brian has as well the passion to support young Slovak entrepreneurs by sharing his business experience, especially where they are desired to expand to the global markets. And now I would like to give the round to Brian. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm just going to bring up the uh, file that we're going to be sharing today. I hope you can see it. Not yet. Let me see if I can share. Apologies. Here we go. We'll try again now. Are you able to see the slides? Mm -hmm. You're able to see it? Sorry. Great, great. Thanks very much. Okay, so my name is Brian Jakubitz. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks very much to uh, the University ITMB to uh, allow me to present. This is actually an interesting topic that uh, keeps on coming up. So the last three years that I've been living here in, in Slovakia, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, startups and incubators and the same questions keep on coming up around the biggest mistakes in business. So that's the reason why I have chosen this topic. Um, and of course, with the many years of experience that I've had in industry, uh, I think I'll be able to share some interesting uh, uh, aspects of what business is like in the industry. So how did it all start? My dad, who is Czech, um, at the age of 15, joined the Batia Corporation. And um, he was part of what they call the Batia School of Work. He studied there for eight years in Zlin. And uh, after that, right before the start of the Second World War, 
he was transferred to Kenya and Africa. Bearing in mind that uh, Thomas Batia, who set up the organization way back more than 100 years ago, uh, set some really, really interesting business principles. And a lot of those business principles are still valid today. And that's one of the reasons why I find the Batia topic so intriguing because of what was shared from my dad. Um, and as I say, with the experiences that I've had in business, there are a lot of uh, similarities that were or that are experienced from all of that uh, many, many years ago. Here you can see my dad meeting Thomas Batia Jr. Uh, so this was the son of the original Thomas Batia. Um, and my dad actually grew in stature from being a salesperson in the early part of his career in Kenya to eventually becoming what is the equivalent of the, as a chief uh, financial officer uh, for the Batia region based in what is now Zimbabwe uh, and was CFO for the Batia Zimbabwe organization. At those, it, in those days, it was called Rhodesia, um, but that's how the inf influence of the business and uh, Batya came to my being and how I try and represent similar sort of uh, parts of, of my life and integrity and so on through the principles of Batya. A little bit more about me. I have uh, lived in Zimbabwe because that's where I was born. I was in South Africa for uh, some years completing my studies and then started my career then. And through company relocations, uh, was in the USA for a while, then United Arab Emirates, and as I said previously, the last three years in Slovakia. For more than 20 years, I've had the position of a director in a number of different uh, global IT companies. Um, and I might talk a little bit more about them as I go forward. But in my last role, and I've just wound down my career in the corporate world as of the end of uh, August, I had responsibility for 157 countries across Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, which meant uh, dealing with over 800 business partners. And in those business partners and countries, we were dealing with over 24 official languages. So I can I'm sure you can imagine some of the complexities that I was having to deal with in the role. And uh, my experience has brought much of the same in the other positions that I had. So as an example, in the US, I had a global position, meaning I had worldwide responsibility for growing business, uh, therefore multiple countries, very exposed to... Um, the details of, of uh, many nationalities, demographics, etc. And that's what I've used as the basis for uh, the discussions that we're having today. So let's start with business. <clears throat> the biggest mistakes that I keep on coming across through my career, and this has happened on multiple occasions, really is the focus on the poor choice of new markets. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit uh, about each of these topics as we go through. So what do I mean by a, a poor choice of, of market? This is really where um, the lack of market research has been done, and therefore um, companies have not necessarily really understood exactly the market that they're trying to break into. They're not aware of the uh, market trends. In other words, they've ignored those. Uh, the big, big thing, and this is where I've had a lot of experience through my career, is understanding cultural differences. This really, really is absolutely critical, particularly uh, in establishing global business. Um, other issues include overlooking of regulatory and legal uh, requirements or challenges, uh, not adapting products and services for the particular markets, and insufficient local partnerships. I think that's really, really critical when we're looking at new markets. If I move on to the next topic, lack of specific goals and quantitative definitions, here uh, really comes down to ambiguity in decision-making. 
the inability to track progress, difficulties in performance evaluation, risk of overcommitting resources, and missed opportunities for learning. So again, you know, huge, huge areas of, uh, of uh, opportunity that is overlooked. So one of the uh, examples that I've got on uh, lack of specific goals and quantitative definitions is one of the companies that I was working for at the time, and I so happened to be based in the US at the, at the time, uh, they were running uh, various projects. They never knew how these projects were running, whether they were profitable, whether they were um, uh, running on time, the number of resources that were involved and so on. So one of the first things that I did as the chief operating officer for that particular organization was introduced a project review board. Here, I took strategically important uh, parts of the organization to form this concise board that we would review every project that was going to be implemented. Here we had, here we had, here we had the opportunity of uh, reviewing projects, whether they made sense to even implement. And as a result of that, we managed to turn at least 85 to 90% of projects back into a profitable situation. Situation. And more importantly, 97% of them we managed to actually complete on time. So there's all sorts of ripple on, uh, um, uh, or not requirements, sorry, a ripple on uh, advantages of this project review board because one, we knew what our profitability was. Two, we increased the customer satisfaction tremendously. And three, as a result of that, started gaining momentum and therefore improving our recognition in the marketplace as being a company that could implement projects successfully and on time. Relationships are the currency of international business. And again, I think this is really, really important because here we're talking about trust and credibility navigating cultural differences. I've already spoken about uh, cultural differences, but here again in international business, navigating differences is really, really important. And of course, market entry to support, um, long-term success and managing crises. Here, what I want to touch on again as a personal experience is that uh, this time I was running a business in South Africa and the company that I was working, up, uh, working for had an expat management team. I was the first of the local managers to re start replacing the expat management team. And what I uncovered pretty quickly is that what uh, the, this company had done was gone to a strategically important partner, uh, had basically employed all of their best staff at a huge uh, premium in terms of, of uh, salaries and so on. And yet the size of the business, as well as the actual staff that we were running, really could not be justified. Uh, what I ended up doing, much to the horror and disgust of many of the employees that had been brought on board, was turn the situation back around and went to the original partner asked them to be my strategic partner in the business. And in so doing, they had to take back all of the uh, highly paid uh, staff that I had, that I had inherited. Um, and through that, I managed to reduce the costs tremendously, but more importantly, again, drive up customer satisfaction by managing one partner who was responsible for the employees rather than my company trying to manage multiple employees that were not necessarily best suited for the job anyway. The next point really, what works in one market may not work in another. Localization is absolutely critical. And here what I'm referring to is, again, failure to address uh, cultural uh, sensitivities, language barriers, regulatory compliance, ineffective marketing, and product adaption. An example that I'd like to use here, again, is when I joined the last company that I've just wrapped up with, 
Uh, my role was to be part of an international project where we were going to gain and take product over the responsibility of one of our an example that I'd like uh, and try to run that part of the business ourselves. To use here the again, style, which is very, very typical with multinationals, it was an American based project with American based management who essentially were looking at what was, you know, worked well in the US, but not necessarily taking into consideration what was happening on the global front. So in other words, one size does not fit all. Um, needless to say, the project went live, was a total disaster because the partnerships that they had uh, secured at a global level did not necessarily have the right footprint in the countries that uh, needed to be uh, serviced. And after a year of, of uh, the project running, it was terminated. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that the majority of the executive management that had uh, implemented the project were fired, and we basically had to go back to the original uh, service provider and rebuild the operation from there. It created all sorts of uh, unnecessary um, friction in the marketplace. We did not do our customers much uh, good. And uh, after a lot of uh, hard work and rebuilding of the structures, managed to regain our position with our customers, increasing our overall um, customer satisfaction and eventually um, positive impact on the product sales. And what I've always seen is that there's always a lack of a plan B. So plan B, I think, is absolutely essential um, for any situation in the market because you never know what might happen. And again, this has happened to me in uh, previous roles as well. So as an example, uh, going back probably 25 years ago, Nigeria was an extremely important uh, country on the African continent, huge population, um, a lot of money. And so it was a great opportunity for us as a company to establish sales and service support operations in Nigeria. We were very, very successful for a number of years until the government decided to change the model to say that they, because of the lack of, of foreign currency, decided that all business conducted in Nigeria was going to be through local currency, the Naira. Um, so you can imagine, all of a sudden, huge issue about how do we get a dollar-based uh, currency back out of, the, out of the country. So we had to move really, really quickly to make sure that we did not lose a business beat or opportunity and make sure that we continue to be able to do successful business in Nigeria, but having changed the model so that we could uh, deal in local currency through local partnerships. So uh, we continue to get paid in dollars, fortunately, but by local partners rather than through individual customers within the country. I'm going to move on a little bit right now because this is what I keep on finding in the mentorship that I've been doing. And I'm not going to stop to run through each one of these, but again, you can see through entrepreneurs and a lot of startups are going through the same issues, just like corporations are having similar situation, that lack of market research continues to be the stumbling block for both uh, established businesses as well as startups. Insufficient planning creates a major, major issue. Understanding financial management certainly is something that I keep on uh, coming across and is highlighted with uh, my working with entrepreneurs. And as I mentioned with the global business, lack of local contacts and partnerships are severely lacking when doing business. From my point of view, if there is no risk of failure, then there can be no success. So we certainly understand that you're going to be at risk. You're certainly going to have failure. But failure really is, helps you to secure more positive business going forward. 
what I've done now is just created a quick comparison. So if you take a look at the left-hand side, so there, the, in other words, the portion in yellow, that was what I've experienced as the mistakes in business. The, the, uh, the white side really is what I've found in uh, my dealings with entrepreneurs. And if you go step by step, quite frankly, there's not a big difference between the two sets of markets. And this is what I've experienced repeatedly, as I say, through my international business career, as well as working with entrepreneurs. Very, very similar mistakes. And this is the area that we really, really need to focus on going forward. So what are the foundations for success? Well, Batia Corporation, I think, uh, calls that out really, really appropriately. You start off by being an apprentice. As you gain experience, you move into being a journeyman. Journeyman, you move into more experience, and eventually you become a master. And this is a continuous circle of gaining skills as you move forward, regardless of what the topic is. And if I take a look at my own career, this is exactly how I started. I started off my career as an electronic engineer working for a computer company as a what they called a customer engineer, so in other words, a computer support technician or support engineer. As I started, I was an apprentice. I needed support from more um, senior people. I needed to learn what the customer issues were, what uh, their biggest pain points were, and so on, because if the customer's uh, computer system went down, obviously business was immediately at risk. As I built experience, I therefore became a journeyman. Now I was able to operate more independently by myself, uh, repairing machines, diagnosing, uh, working directly with customers to make sure that they were satisfied when the system was actually down. After a period of time, in my case, I did not carry on from a technical point of view, but uh, moved into management, hence my uh, first taste of, of uh, experience as a, manage, as a manager. But bearing in mind, since I was now a new manager, in a lot of ways, I was jumping back to becoming an apprentice, learning the ropes of management. As I learned those ropes, I moved into a journeyman of management, to a more experienced manager, and then eventually into a master at management, and hence my 20 plus years of being a director in executive positions with the various companies that I work for. But again, coming back to these pillars, it doesn't mean to say that you, you stop at being a master. You should always be constantly learning, in which case you are constantly going into the cycle of apprentice, journeyman, experience, and master. It does not mean to say that you have to follow that sequence each and every time, because as a master, as an example, you might need to know a specific legal requirement. I'm going to use the example here in Europe, where for um, IT and many, many other consumer products, uh, companies have to provide a two-year warranty. Now, having come from an environment where two-year warranty was unheard of, I had to learn very, very quickly what the legal requirements are here in the EU. So as a master in my management job, basically I jumped to apprentice to speak to legal representatives and uh, know how to gain that knowledge about what the requirements are did I have to be a specialist in, in uh, the knowledge of the two-year warranty? Absolutely not. I needed to know the basics. So from an apprentice, I managed to jump straight back into master. Of course, if you were a lawyer and needed to know all the ins and outs of two-year uh, warranty, then surely you would have to move into journeyman experience, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I hope you can kind of grasp the concept of how this process works. And Batia was very, very successful in running this model with all of their employees. So key principles that uh, Thomas Batia had in his organization was really customer focus. And I think this was really, really unique in the way he operated. 
two points that I would like to point out here specifically about the principles. First of all, it was Batya that introduced the 99-cent deals. In other words, you buy a product for $1.99. And from a marketing point of view and therefore from a customer perspective, it was enticing because you realize you're not paying two euros as an example for a product, but one ninety nine, absolutely remarkable. This is a great deal, and as a result, he made uh, a, a great step into uh, customer environment on how to deal with customers. The other point about customer focus that was unique with his organization is that in the shops. When a customer came in and wanted a, a specific pair of shoes, their sales reps were uh, taught how to gauge what the customer was looking for and not necessarily just bring out the one pair of shoes that the customer was asking about, but various sizes, various models, various colors, because there was a great opportunity for the sales guys to end up selling more than one pair of shoes because the customer was so intrigued by the other offerings as well. So uh, a really, really amazing principle that he had with customer focus. Uh, global footprint, uh, well, I think it goes without saying. Over 100 years ago, the Batya Corporation started in Czechoslovakia, and today if you consider how many different countries they are uh, present in, right across all of the um, continents. I think a, a great learning for a lot of uh, current global companies that are out there. Efficiency and productivity. The interesting concept here, again, with the key principle is that each uh, individual business unit was managed as a total business. So the leather department bought in uh, hides. They would have those hides, or in other words, skins, uh, go through the tanning process. Once that tanning process was done, which they had to pay for, they would sell that uh, piece of leather to production. Production would therefore buy that piece of leather, do the cutting of the shoes, preparation of the shoes. That shoe was then sold to the next part of the operation, and each one of those organizations ran as a total uh, profit center, which again was really, really unique because each part of the company knew exactly how much their costs were, how much their revenues were, and therefore could predict, could predict overall profitability. The final bit that I really, really liked about the principles is how the employee welfare and development was uh, managed. And probably one of the key items that I would like to bring to your attention here is that uh, many years ago, obviously in the uh, depression of the 20s, uh, Thomas Batia took the decision, even though there was an international downturn in business, rather than laying off employees, he insisted that all employees took a salary cut. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of uh, uh, concern from the employees, but what was great is that when uh, the things recovered eventually, the economy recovered, he had a full workforce and was able to very, very quickly reconvene full production. I've experienced that in my career as well. So going back to the 80s, there was a worldwide recession. I so happened to be working for Hewlett Packard at the time. And while all other technology companies were laying staff off, Hewlett Packard took the decision to rather request a 10% salary cut from all managers and a 5% uh, salary cut by all employees on a global basis. Now, this was regardless whether one country was doing extremely well, as an example, or whether it was in a country where the uh, recession was really impacting severely. Of course, again, everybody was concerned, including myself as a manager. How am I going to pay my mortgage taking it 10% uh, salary cut? Where was I going to get the money to pay for the weekly groceries, et cetera, et cetera? But when you sit down and realize that 
that having a job with a slightly lower salary is far, far beneficial than actually being laid off. And when the economy grew again on a global basis, HP was very, very quick to, to rebound and uh, was back into full production and sales and services in a very, very short time, whereas their competitors were now having to go out, hire new employees, try and find uh, talent, et cetera, and really, really not an easy process. And unfortunately, companies are still doing that this today. As soon as there's a downturn in the economy, they are very, very quick to uh, lay, employee, lay employees off. Um, yes, when the economy rebounds, they might be able to find uh, cheaper resources and so on, but typically it takes a long time to re uh, retrain and get everybody back up to uh, full productivity. And as a result, I'm a firm believer that is more, more is lost than is gained through that particular process. Okay, so for me, what has really helped me take the right decisions, and I'm not necessarily going to go into each one of these uh, key topics, but I think it's absolutely critical in business uh, to have a high level of integrity. From my own point of view, I prefer to work in a team rather than individually. Uh, but really what I've been able to successfully do for many, many years in my career is have a very, very solid uh, leadership style um, where in some ways, I guess I'm a little bit hands off, allowing my staff to actually take their own decisions and then for me to, to guide them. But what that brings certainly to them is accountability. And I think this is really a critical part of overall success that um, for me has been the solid pillars of great uh, management. And I use that through my process of mentorship as well. What I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about the differences of conducting business in the various countries that I've operated in. Everybody likes this idea of breaking into the uh, US market. And yes, for very good reason, because the advantages of doing business in the US is that it is a large and very diverse market. The access to capital and funding is enormous, particularly with uh, venture capitalists and so on. And they continue to be particularly strong when it comes to uh, technical uh, innovation. I'm not gonna go through all of the rest of the advantages. However, what people don't realize is just how risky business can be because of the highly competitive environment that the market is. Legal litigation, as you know, in the US, there's always some issue about uh, legal litigation. And you know, two of the examples that I'd like to bring up here is that uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the McDonald incidents when a lady uh, went through their drive through ordered a cup of coffee, put the cup of coffee, hot cup of coffee for that matter, between her legs and drove off. As she drove off, so the coffee spilt and she had severe uh, burns on her legs. You would think that it's, you know, what a silly thing to do. She should have known better. The reality in the U.S. is that she sued McDonald's and she actually won her case. And so, you know, it's really, really difficult from a legal perspective to deal in the U.S. The other um, interesting topic I had, I was... Uh, uh, in a executive management uh, course at Stanford University, and we were talking about the case of, um, you know, these huge campers, they call them uh, recreation ve vehicles. It's like a bus that has been fully rigged out like a caravan, and so you can drive, park it wherever you want and, and have your holiday or stay over, whatever the case is. But in this particular case, the driver was driving, he got tired, he realized that there was the, um, and I can't recall what they call it here in, in uh, Europe, but basically speed cruise or speedo cruise, where you know, when you add a certain uh, speed, you can push the button and the car, or, or in this case, RV continues at that particular speed. Well, the guy did that, he set the speed and thought, okay, now this is it, we are, comfortably traveling at whatever uh, 
speed kilometers an hour or miles an hour in the US and decided to get up out of the driver's seat and go to relax in the back. Of course, he had a major accident. Uh, he sued the company because the uh, owner's manual was not specific enough about the fact that you cannot uh, leave the driver's seat when you set, set the speedo cruise. And funnily enough, again, he won his, uh, his, won his case. Market saturation, obviously, is also a huge, huge um, risk for business in the U.S., and that's the one thing I would say about any company trying to break into the U.S. market. You may have the most creative idea in, say, here in Europe. Uh, take it to the U.S., and there's a very, very good chance that somebody else has thought of a similar product or um, has the exact same product, either failed abysmally with the product or has been a total, total success. Uh, but market saturation is a huge, huge deal, obviously, in the U.S. Moving on. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences when I lived in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, on the positive side, the Arab world is generally very, very cash rich, particularly because of oil reserves. In the case of Dubai, because of the attraction of uh, multinational global companies setting up headquarters uh, in the city. What is great because of, of uh, United Arab Emirates and or the Middle East generally is that uh, skilled workforce is highly sought after and because of them being cash rich, they're able to buy in just about any resource that they would ever, ever need to, um, uh, need to cover their business. Very much technology driven. Uh, again, if you take a look at, at uh, Dubai, the fact that they are basically a desert oasis, um, there is no uh, access to natural water uh, sources. So all water in Dubai is basically desalinated. In other words, comes from the sea, they desalinate it. Not really fit for human consumption, but perfectly okay to shower in, to uh, cook with, etc. And that's very typical of what happens in the um, Arab world. However, on the other side, difficulties of doing business. So in Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, women have recently uh, basically gained a lot of freedom. Uh, however, because of uh, local laws, as a male, I cannot go and do business with a woman in Saudi. So we would have to have women dealing with women on a business, uh, you know, business to business basis. Very, very difficult. Um, but that's unfortunately one of the, the laws. Cultural and language differences, basically being a Westerner in an Arab world, uh, there's a lot of uh, mistrust and so on. And there's also a lot of bureaucracy and or red tape. And if you don't understand what red tape means, basically bureaucracy. Moving on, and again, I just want to share some uh, quick highlights here. So comparing South Africa and Nigeria. So South Africa today is probably the biggest, second biggest uh, economy in, uh, in Africa, uh, what is very positive about South Africa, though, it is a re-emerging market and regional hub. Uh, and this is specifically after the um, democratic elections of the mid-90s. Um, there's a lot of natural resources and diverse industries in South Africa, uh, and therefore a huge market potential. And South Africa, as I say, is kind of the regional hub to springboard into some of the countries that uh, immediately surround it to the west, to the north, and to the east of the country. Um, Nigeria, on the other hand, uh, access to capital is a major, major issue. As I've mentioned previously, they changed the, the laws because of the lack of foreign exchange, and therefore, um, to deal with Nigeria in local currency makes it almost prohibitive from a global perspective. There's always issues in Nigeria, unfortunately, with the electricity and power supply. Most industries run off of generators. 
um, because of the fact that the electricity source is just so unreliable. And of course, it is a very, very well-known issue, and I'm sure you've probably received personal emails about uh, opportunities of big business and, you know, sign up and we're going to send you this huge amount of, of cash directly to your bank account. Bribery and corruption is rife, unfortunately, in Nigeria. Finally, I wanted to touch a little bit about uh, doing business here in Europe, and I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with it. But, um, you know, some of the positives, Europe is a large and diverse market. Generally, there's a very highly skilled uh, workforce here and, again, stable political and economic environment. Yes, there are some issues that we're experiencing right now, unfortunately, with the war in Ukraine, but typically fairly stable from a political and economic uh, perspective. However, the threats for doing business here, very, very complex regulatory um, environment. There's differences between EU and non-EU countries, as an example, therefore varying uh, customs regulations uh, for imports and exports. Uh, of course, we all know about uh, the UK now that uh, Brexit has, has uh, finally taken its toll and so on. So very, very complex in ter terms of doing business across uh, Europe. It's a high cost of doing business as well. Because of the highly skilled uh, workforce, it tends to be expensive to do business here as well. And very similarly to the States, because of the... Um, the the skill levels of creativity of entrepreneurs and new products and new technologies that are emerging from uh, Europe, a very, very competitive marketplace as well. So in conclusion, entering an international marketplace is thrilling, but very, very challenging. And that's not only into the international space. I mean, if we take a look at entrepreneurs operating here in Slovakia, uh, they are dealing with exactly these same issues. Um, the second point, with proper preparation, research and adaptability, success is within reach. The biggest issue that I've come across in dealing with business on a global basis and at the entrepreneurship level, even locally, the biggest single thing that is lacking is a, is a business plan. I'm not going to go run through how to put a business plan together. I mean, there are many, many templates available on the internet and so on. But, you know, what is highly critical in the business plan is understanding who your market is, what your competition is doing, what your go-to-market strategy is going to be, et cetera. And so, therefore, really focus in on those areas in terms of uh, building or expanding your business. And remember, the world is your oyster. So go and conquer the global market because it's certainly there to be conquered. Yes, there are some difficulties, but if you have the right creativity and the right drive and determination, business can certainly be very, very successful through that particular process. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, as you notice, Slovakia is now my new home. I'm really, really enjoying living here and certainly plan to live here uh, for the remainder of my years. And so thanks very much again for your interest and participation. And feel free to reach out to me if you would like to discuss any business topics. And with that, I would like to finish the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for your inspiring presentation. And now I would like to read uh, one question that uh, comes to our Slido. So if you are ready, I'm going to read. So which kind of uh, the startup advice would you like to recommend to young student, Slovak student? So which kind of the startup advice would you like to recommend to, to young Slovak student? Okay, so I've done a lot of uh, mentoring with startups and specific to young students. And the, again, biggest weakness, and I'm going to come right back to the last point that I was referring to, 
is the business plan. You really need to have a solid business plan. Again, I'm not going to run through all of the key topics, but a business plan should cover your executive summary, identifying exactly what your product is, and then breaking down the various uh, key topics. How is your competition placed? Uh, what is your pricing model going to be? How are you going to finance your product? Uh, where are you going to sell your product, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, you know, a business plan contains maybe six or seven key elements. If you follow those um, pointers that are readily available on the Internet, uh, you will have a reasonably good start to see whether your product has even got a chance of faring in the marketplace. You know, unfortunately, with a lot of startups, creativity is absolutely amazing. And you think you've got this wow product that is definitely needed in all spheres of the marketplace. And unfortunately, it's not always the case. So what you think is might be a great creative idea doesn't always fly, unfortunately. Um, for whoever asked that question, if you are willing to put your business plan together and if you would like some of my quick advice on that business plan, feel free to share it with me and I will give you some quick uh, you know, feedback. I, I don't mind a little bit of 15-minute of, uh, free consulting to or, or mentorship to put you in the right direction. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, answer and maybe I would like to mention as well that you are a mentor of University Technology Incubator. So if some of the students would like to uh, get your advice as well, they, they can come uh, to the incubator and we will contact you as well. This is another possibility. So sure, there is sure. so many ways like the, how to get the, the inspiration or the right answer. Can I just make uh, one final comment coming back to yes. mentorship because I think it's really, really important. Um, and I know it's sort of a little bit of a competitive environment to yourselves, but um, I've, I am a mentor as well with junior achievement. I'm not too sure if everybody is aware of what junior achievement is, but basically a global uh, nonprofit that helps um, – Basically, high school students as well as uh, fresh entrepreneurs in terms of how to go about starting a business. Well, here in Slovakia, um, they had a competition amongst multiple or many, many schools across uh, Slovakia. And um, the winner of this year's competition so happened to be a high school from Košice. Uh, that was then going to go forward to the European level of the competition. Uh, the school asked me to be their mentor, um, and I really helped them tremendously uh, in collaboration with uh, basically my business partner to identify where their weaknesses were on uh, go-to-market strategy, uh, uh, product positioning, and so on. Uh, and essentially, we help them rebuild their business plan. Well, I'm pleased to report that when they uh, competed in Istanbul, Turkey uh, in July, competing against 40 other countries, they came third overall. And I was really, really proud of the school. Yes, I'm proud of what we helped them uh, achieve as well by with the, you know with the rewriting of the business plan and so on. But it was their product, their creativity, their ingenuity, their presentations that got them to the success. So I was very, very proud of their overall achievement. And, and that's really what mentorship is with entrepreneurs and startups and incubators and so on. So congratulations, nice result. Yeah. We're going to check it if we have another question, but unfortunately we don't have. And so it was just only one question. I'm so sorry, Brian. It's okay. Well, hopefully everybody understood what I was presenting and agreed with it. So. <laughs>
<laughs> to, to leave the message, of course. Maybe I would like to give you one question. Is it possible to compare uh, the European market uh, with the American market? What is the differences that uh, maybe uh, some of the students or alumni of STU, they would like to start with their business or run the business, maybe they should focus on some market, what is uh, better for them? If they know the market, the European market, is better to focus on the European market than the uh, American? Well, I think it really depends on the product and how they're trying to position the product. Um, you know, I've been working with um, a particular startup uh, right now that is wanting to span it beyond... Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia. So in other words, into the rest of the EU markets, um, which is probably a good place to start, uh, just to kind of understand the differences. But let me tell you, even focusing on just EU countries, there's a lot of complexities that go with it. So if there's those complexities in the EU market, you can imagine what it's going to be like in the American market. As I said previously, you know, if if you thought of something here, there's a high likelihood they've they've thought of of similar there. However, having said that, and I don't want to be negative about the American market because, as I previously said, if you take a look at venture venture capitalist uh, or capital availability, absolutely enormous. So if you've got the right product, the right creativity, and you can get to the right people, they can help you break into the American market really, really easily. And, you know, we've seen that a number of times with Slovak companies. Um, I, I'm not too sure if it's a Slovak or a Czech company uh, that recently came out, well, when I say recently, in the last sort of nine to 12 months, with a, um, a software app that Google themselves found really, really intriguing and ended up buying. Well, it took those guys from, you know, creativity, never ever thinking of what was going to be available for them in terms of financial world, all of a sudden to be multimillionaires. And, you know, those opportunities are certainly there. There are a lot of companies likewise that are unfortunately, in my mind, somewhat exploiting uh, Slovak creativity by feeding information into, and I, you know, it's not, it's not a political thing, so don't get me wrong, but feeding into the Arab world as an example. So basically exploiting young talent for the benefit of, of uh, the Arab world. For me, I think there's so much creativity here. There's so much opportunity to help build the Slovak economy that I'm a firm believer of, you know, let's not lose this talent to to the broader world, let alone to, to specific countries, we need to try and retain the talent here to help build the Slovak economy. I can't do it by myself, but I'm an absolute 100% advocate of this is what the country needs. For a population of five and a half million people to have so much talent, whether it be in entrepreneurship or, you know, in the musical world or the arts or whatever, I am absolutely blown away with just how exceptionally talented Slovaks are. And again, we need to retain that talent here. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, speech and uh, about the uh, Slovak people and the creativity. Maybe the last question a little bit uh, directly to you on your personality. What do you like the most in Slovakia? <laughs> Wow. Okay. There, there's. Uh, I don't think there's one single thing because, um, as you, as I said earlier, I've decided to uh, retire here in Slovakia. I'm doing some uh, teaching at a couple of uh, high schools right now. But really, what I like about Bratislava in particular is the outdoor life, as an example, from being able to walk or hike, plus uh, cycling, which I like to do, cycling through towns and villages, getting onto the Danube, cycling back into Bratislava, absolutely amazing. The, um, uh, the arts and cultural society here, again, absolutely amazing. I mean, some of the uh, folklore, 
um, events that I've been to in terms of music and dance absolutely amazes me. Just general musical talent amazes me here. Again, creativity with uh, young entrepreneurs and so on. What's there not to like? And of course, Bratislava being so close to surrounding countries just makes it easy to expand your horizons. But I mean, everything is here, okay, besides the sea, but what beautiful mountains and lakes and rivers and so on. It's phenomenal. It really is phenomenal. So there is a lot of things, but yes, I agree with you that uh, the connection that you can walk uh, everywhere by foot and as well, a lot of uh, lakes and the mountains around uh, uh, are amazing, yes. And safety is a big issue as well, quite honestly. I mean, it's one of the more safe environments. If I have to compare, obviously, even US or South Africa, it's not a comparison. Bratislava is very, very safe. Okay, so if we don't have any questions, so I would like to uh, finish our live stream. So thank you one more time, Brian, uh, for your inspiring presentation. And uh, now I would like to mention the next uh, events of University Technology Incubator, uh, which uh, the people you can find uh, on our web uh, Facebook profile or uh, our website incubi.com.sk. Uh, and see you on the 2nd of October, where uh, we will speak about the emotional intelligence. And this event will be only for the students and postgraduate students of STU. And the maximum uh, capacity is for 30 participants. So, and the last uh, thing, please fill out the feedback form through the hashtag Jakubet on Slido.com. Thank you, Brian, one more time and have a nice day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Cez OBS -ko, ukončenie, ukončiť live stream a uložiť sa to uloží automaticky.